Well, good morning, church. It's so good to see you here today. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the members on staff here at Redemption. We just want to say welcome. We're so glad that you guys are here with us to worship this morning. And something that we do um, on a weekly basis is we read from God's word as we kick things off in worship. So I want to invite you with me and the team, if you're able, let's stand together as we do that. And uh, this is a very familiar passage. It comes out of Romans chapter 8, and it says this. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. That's good news, amen. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what I want to remind you of this morning is that the God who holds every single corner of the universe in the palm of his hand, he also is in your corner fighting for you every single day. The same, the same chapter actually says that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And so God freely gave up himself just to show that, man, there is nothing that is going to come between me and my child and to, to show my love for them. And I want to remind you this morning that nothing, nothing, there's no power ever that can separate you from God's love. Do you believe that? Amen? This morning, man, know that God's love is that strong. So that's what we're going to sing about today. So let's go. Let's do it. We sing. We won't fear the battle. We won't fear the night. We will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us. You will lead the way. And we have found a refuge only you can say. Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Who can stand? Even when I turn back, even when I fall, even when I turn back, still your love is sure. You will not abandon, you will not forsake, and you will cheer me on with never ending grace. Come on now. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Yeah, he's for us, yeah. Come on, we say, Neither high nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me love. We're going to sing that again. Neither high nor dead can separate us. Hell and death, he will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me in his love. Yeah. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against this if our God is for us? Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against if our God is for us, oh, He's for us, He's for us, yeah. 
always for us. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. Sun comes up. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before, let me be singing when the evening comes. In. Come on, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. You're rich in love, and you so to your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep oh sing it ten thousand reasons for my heart to find yeah. come on all together we sing bless the lord oh my soul His holy name, sing like never, sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Because hey. you're worthy of all my praise. God, you're worthy of all my praise, yeah. Come on, we sing. And on that day, when my strength is bare, the end draws me. And my time has come. You see it out still. Still my soul in your way unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Cause you're worthy, God, of all my praise. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, worship your holy name. Yes, I worship your holy name. 
Oh God, I worship your holy name. You're worthy of all my praise. What a good God. Thanks for singing today, church. You can go ahead and take a seat. Good morning, Redemption. How's everybody doing this morning? My name is Brent Seibert. I'm one of the volunteers here at Redemption, and uh, LG asked me to come out this morning, talk to you guys real quick. Next weekend, we have the Women's Alive Conference. Uh, hopefully, you're signed up for that. That's right. Um, but really, I'm going to be honest. I'm here to talk about Men's Advance on May 17th and 18th. Uh, that's the purpose of why I'm out here, uh, along with a couple other gentlemen from the uh, uh, the church, uh, I'm going to be one of the cooks that day. We're going to have a great two days out at Cool Springs where we're going to have some fellowship. We're going to worship. We're going to eat and eat and eat. Uh, we've got pork loins wrapped in bacon lined up. We've got fish going to be fried up, some German fried potatoes. Who doesn't like those? Uh, we're going to have ribeye steak sandwiches. We're going to do it right. Uh, so it's going to be a good time. Steve uh, Flex is going to have a bus again for those that don't want to drive out or spend the night. You can contact Steve if you're interested in doing that. Uh, so I encourage you to go get signed up. It's 50 bucks. Uh, again, it's May 17th and 18th out at Cool Springs, which is just west of Holland. It's going to be a great time. We're going to fish, going to throw some axes, and again, more importantly, we're going to worship uh, together and have a great time. So get signed up. Check out the bumper, and Daryl, get us started. Well, good morning, Redemption. Super glad to see you with us today. I want to start off uh, with a long quote by Theodore Roosevelt once said. You may have heard it before. It's kind of popular. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, because there's no effort without error or shortcoming. But who knows the man's great enthusiasms, great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of a high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. So that this place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither knew victory nor defeat. I always love that quote. Those who get out and actually dare to do something, they're going to fail and they can be criticized, but at least they're doing something. It reminds me of D.L. Moody, the famous evangelist who was evangelizing one time and a lady came up to him and said, uh, Pastor Moody, I don't like the way you evangelize. He says, well, that's okay. I don't always like the way I do it either. Why don't you tell me how you do it? And she goes, well, I don't. And he says, well, I like the way I do it better than the way you don't. <laughs> you know, in this relationship series, the thing about relationships, one of the things that we felt that was important to cover is this area of the chronic critic. So today we're gonna to talk about being more kind and less critical. We live in a hypercritical society, don't we? I mean, I think it's just at an all time high. People feel emboldened to speak their minds sometimes and not have a filter. And, and the reality is nothing hurts relationships more than constant criticism. The critical spirit can bring down a room faster than anything. More marriages have been damaged through critical uh, spirits. The churches have been hurt. Teams have fought, been torn apart. Places of work have become hostile. Friendships have become scarred by the constant critic. Someone who gives their opinion on everything and nitpicks on every issue. Constant criticism, criticism is kryptonite for relationships. 
And it often masquerades as critical thinking, of asking the right questions. And there's nothing wrong with critical thinking and asking the right questions. But when you are a Christ follower, when you are a Christian, you are to be a little Christ. That's what that means, following him. And you'll notice his words were more kind and less critical. When we become a Christian, the Spirit of God is supposed to transform our spirit. And we learn to boost each other up and not be doom and gloom all the time. So what I want to do is I want to take just a few moments to learn some of the follies of critical, a critical spirit. And I want to use a story from the Bible, uh, from John chapter 12, to do this. Now, in this passage, it's the account of Jesus' feet being anointed. Um, and there are several accounts in the Gospels. Uh, at least two of them are different accounts. And one of them uh, is recorded a couple of different times. This one is. And this is Mary, uh, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who anoints Jesus' feet. And she's so grateful for what he's done. Now remember, Jesus, Lazarus is the one that has been raised from the dead by Jesus. Jesus has loved on them, cared for them. He's very close to them. In fact, this, the passage last week that LG taught from was these three people, four people, counting Jesus, along with his disciples again. Um, and, and when Mary and Martha, and Martha was in the kitchen working while Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, same people, same type of situation, different occasion. And here's what we're going to read, beginning in verse 1. Six days before the Passover celebration, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man who, had raised, uh, who he had raised from the dead. The dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, as was her custom, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, for... He was a thief, and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Now, this is really an awesome story, and such a neat uh, story about Mary's Worship, and that's what it should have been about. She was so honored by Jesus and what he'd done, and she seemed to have insight to what was coming. She need, seemed to understand more than many of Jesus' followers what was going to happen, and she just wanted so desperately to, to honor him. And, and this seems strange in our culture because we don't do feet washing in our culture. In that culture, it was not that uncommon to have foot washing, and especially through the honored guest. And so what she did was, was absolutely an honorable thing, an act of worship, a great thing. And then Judah Judas just throws it all under and, and criticizes. He claimed it's a waste of funds, which we'll get into that argument in just a little bit. But I want to follow through his actions the folly of critical, a critical spirit. The first thing I want you to see is, of a critical spirit is criticism often says more about the critic than it does about the one being criticized. The one criticizing actually is revealing more about their character and their actions and their motives sometimes than the person that they're criticizing. And we see this all the time. Judas has an ulterior motive. The gospel writer says in verse 6, not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he would steal from them. They didn't have accounting like we do today, so it was easy for him to just slip some money aside and, and keep it for himself. And so Everything that she spent, he thought, man, she could have given that money to us and I could have used some of that money. It was a, it was a wrong-hearted motive, a selfish motive. But isn't it interesting, because it's what he says sounds like it makes sense, because criticism often masquerades as insight. And that's what he did. And I've seen this time and time again. Even just recently, I remember... Um, back de uh, during the Super Bowl, there was a lot of grumbling online about an ad that was put out by a group of 
Christians called, called He Gets Us. And I don't know if you remember the ad, but the, they were, it was shown uh, washing the feet of people who were far from God, some of them, and different, living different lifestyles. And the people, the Christians, were washing the feet. And a lot of people didn't like that. And I don't mind if you are critical of the ad. We can all have different uh, opinions. I personally liked it and, and the overall message. But what I found amusing is that some people who didn't like the ad used this same excuse that Judas used. Well, I mean, you pay millions of dollars for a Super Bowl ad. That money could have been used for the poor. And they have no clue what he gets us is all about because, in fact, I know some of the people involved in he gets us, and they literally give millions and millions of dollars to help the poor. But you don't know that when you're shouting it out of your mouth, do you? And that's what we see sometimes is we're often so quick, we have a reason to not like something, so we criticize it with things that really have nothing to do with what we don't like. And that's what Judas was doing here. And he had selfish motives. And I'm convinced, folks, that many times our criticisms come out of selfish motives, or at least mine do. I can't speak for yours, but I can mine. The bottom line is, oftentimes we criticize because we're spoiled, entitled people that thinks, think things should go our way, and we think we always know best. I've seen this a lot in the church world down through the years and 50 years of living, you know, how many times do people criticize oh, I, the, the, the worship, for example, the music worship, when ultimately their criticism is not, was these words uplifting to God or glorifying God or were they attractional to people? Their criticism is often grown out of, I don't like this style or I don't like these songs instead of actually critiquing it. In, in a proper way. It comes out, of, well, think about it in just real life. Uh, I get to uh, help coach basketball and I think about oftentimes, how many times do we say, boy, I don't like that coach. Now, if you get to the bottom of, why don't you like that coach? A lot of times it's, well, he doesn't play my son or my daughter enough. <laughs> Nothing wrong with caring for your children, but the criticism of that coach is often less about that coach's coaching is him not doing it the way we like. Or think about marriage and marriage, our criticism of our spouse or to our spouse. Oftentimes, it's about us not getting our way. It's often ulterior motives. Sometimes we do it because we think we know the best. Sometimes we nitpick because we're virtual sing signaling. Sometimes we have low self-esteem and somehow we think by tearing somebody else down, maybe, maybe we're building ourselves up. Uh, Many people criticize out of habit. It's just in their nature. Some are perfectionist, and so they focus on the 1%. If 99% was good, they focus on the 1% that was bad. Some people think it's their spiritual gift to criticize. <laughs> I've looked through the Bible. I can't find that spiritual gift listed anywhere. For some, it's learned behavior because of a parent or teacher or a coach that has influenced you. Listen, I'm not saying there should never be constructive criticism. We can grow sometimes when we have input and feedback from others. The Bible's clear that sometimes we should go to someone when they have, we have a problem with them. But the Bible's also clear that we should be slow to speak and quick to listen. And it's also clear that we should be building people up, not tearing down. Even when we go to someone, we're speaking the truth in love. And if we're constantly doing it, it's more because we like our way and we think our way's best. And we live in a culture where criticism is not just the norm, it is coming by leaps and bounds. And I could give lots of reasons, social media is a big one, leaders who embolden us to say things that are just awful is another one. There's all kinds of them. But the bottom line is we have this cancel culture, we have this attitude out there that we can take people down with by criticizing them who we disagree with. We can silence our critics by being critical. The second thing I see from Judas's story though is that oftentimes critical thinking, uh, negative criticism is contagious. I don't know if you realize that or not, it, 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 it grows. Judas lashes out here, and we don't learn this in the John account, but in another gospel account, we learn that the other disciples chime in. They agree with him. Because when some, one person says it, then, oh, certainly, we, can, we, can, we agree, and we're more emboldened to say out, and it just gets contagious, and 
we jumped on and criticism is so contagious and we really see this in the world of social media where we see uh, actors and musicians get canceled because of something they said or something they perceived to have said or we see scientists or doctors who are shut down because they have dissenting views from the majority of others. We, we see all kinds of social media attacks. We, we see religious leaders who are canceled because they said something that some other religious person didn't agree with. And what happens is we become very, very, it becomes contagious and it becomes very, very hypocritical. In fact, that's what Jesus says about the Pharisees all throughout scripture. He says in Matthew 16, six, watch out, Jesus warned, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In other words, the yeast spreads and they're making it spread. And what I've discovered is if I'm around more critical people, I tend to be more critical myself. It's, it's just, it, it's just, so if I'm not hanging around with you, you know why now, right? No, I'm just joking. But I have had to learn that if I spend too much time around gripers and critical people, I become more gripey and more critical. And I don't want to be that way. That's not who God designed me and called me and saved me to be. And nor is it you. And so we need to be careful of that. The third thing I see, though, that we learned from Judas' account here is that criticism can really damage others. The old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. We know that's a lie, don't we? It's not true. It was meant out of good intentions. But the reality is words do more damage than almost anything else. Think about this scene. Mary was so grateful for Jesus. He'd been such a good friend, good Lord. He'd raised her brother from the dead. And she decides to do something big and lavish. And she had worked hard for this moment. And then Judas chimes in years wages you could have given this to the poor you know criticism can take the edge off the finest deed can it it really can you know the old saying no good deed comes goes unpunished i i, I mean judas's criticism here probably made mary second guess herself probably hurt her feelings maybe it made her wonder what you know what in the world should i have done i maybe i should have done it differently I remember I was at a worship service one time and it was just, the preacher decided that week, it was a small church I went to, he decided for the Sunday evening message, rather than preach a full message, he was gonna do a message through song. And so he would talk about the message of the song and he would sing the song. Powerful service. There was a lady in that that, that was ready to go forward and just at, during the response invitation time, but she heard some of the others around them talking about how terrible it was. This is awful, he should have preached a sermon. And, all that, and she, they, they quenched the spirit in her to go do what God was calling her to do. I think, how many times does that happen? Romans chapter 14 says this. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fail. He's saying our critical spirit and our words can cause believers to stumble. And worse than that, it can cause unbelievers to walk away from God because they think the church is so judgmental. The brother of James talked about the power of words. He said it's like a spark that can start a forest fire, it can control a, a horse with a small bit, a ship with a tiny rung. And then and he says in James chapter one, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight ring on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Those are strong words. He's saying our words have the power of life and death. How are you using your words? And by the way, sometimes our criticism, we're not even brave enough to critique the person we do it through the, somebody else, and that's called gossip, and the Bible says a lot about gossip. It's a sin as well. Author Scott Soley says, gossip is the pornography of the mouth. It's a cheap thrill at someone else's expense. I've heard some in the church frame it as a prayer request. I could go on and on with the follies and dangers of criticism, it literally destroys relationships. In fact, researcher John Gottman identified it as one of the top predictors of divorce. 
That's something, isn't it? Now, I'm guessing some of you guys, like me, sometimes struggle with this, or maybe you want to know if you struggle like this. So I decided to borrow a little bit from comedian Jeff Foxworthy. You know, he has all the you might be a redneck if jokes. That's what he got famous on. Well, I'm, I'm going to borrow and say you might have a critical spirit if. And I'm just going to have an opportunity for us to evaluate ourselves. You might have a critical spirit if you always have strong opinions and have to share them with everyone. If you always have strong opinions and have to share them with everyone. Now, I want to say something. Sometimes some of us are wired with critical thinking. Therefore, we have opinions, and that's okay. But guess what? We don't always have to share those opinions. Around my house, my kids say, I'm, I have to always be right. They call me a know-it-all a little bit. And the truth is, I do know it all. <laughs> but I don't have to tell them everything. Sometimes we need to hold on to it. In fact, Proverbs chapter 18, I love it, says, fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to share their own opinions. Again, strong words. Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to share their own opinions. And we need to be careful of this. It doesn't mean that we never share our opinions, by the way. Sometimes we do speak the truth in love. Sometimes we need to help someone out. Sometimes we need to call a brother out who's stumbling that we see and we can help him out. But we need to be careful. James says to be slow to speak and quick to listen. I think we get that reversed sometimes. Secondly, you might have a critical spirit if you're hypersensitive or have a hypersensitive attitude towards others. I find it interesting that we are so self-centered that we're so easily offended all the time. And therefore, we're quick to respond back in criticism, defensive. I'm amazed at how offended we can get these days, especially in the online world. Um, one of the things... I've seen so many times is how many times in the Christian world we'll turn on a, a, a pastor who he just has something we we get so offended by something they say or uh, and, and this isn't in the church I don't experience this that much but like in the online world it's just amazing how you can spend I'll see po post after post criticizing these leaders I'm thinking how do you have that much time to even think about it I, I think as Christians we need to be the most unoffendable people. We should be hard to offend. Truth is, if you're always angry and offended, you probably have an inflamed ego. A critical spirit says everybody else is an idiot but me. And sometimes I can confess that I, I feel that way. But as Christians, we need to be less offended. Uh, I know what some of you are saying, but Daryl, we live in an evil world. Satan is is attacking and, and we need to criticize and be offended. And I get it, I understand that. But I like how um, author Brant Hansen, author of the book Unoffendable, puts it. He says, yes, the world is broken, but don't be offended by it. Instead, thank God that he's intervening in it, that he's gonna restore it to everything it was meant to be. His kingdom is breaking through bit by bit. That's why we always say, let's not curse the darkness, let's turn on the light. Thirdly, you might have a critical spirit if you often have a negative view of others' intentions. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes this world's made us so cynical that we want to judge not everybody's actions, but their intentions behind their actions. But you know the reality is none of us know people's heart but God. He's the only one. And I think if we start with the premise that most people are good-willed in their approach, even if they're on the opposite side of an issue, let's say in the political world, they're on the opposite. I talk to people every week, Christian friends of mine, because I know they have a negative, hateful attitude toward people who are on the opposite political side as them. That bothers me. I have some very good friends that believe totally different than I do. How wrong is it of us to think that we have to, that everybody has to agree, you know, they, they must be ill-intentioned if they believe that way. If they're uh, right wing or left wing, they must be evil intentions. No, listen, only God judges intentions. Romans chapter 14, Paul says it this way. 
He says, who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. What's he saying there? He's saying, listen, you're not their master. There's one master, it's God. And he's the one that gets to judge how they serve him. And get this, with their help, they're gonna make it to heaven too. So it's not your job to condemn. Now, I'm not suggesting we should never offer a, cr a critique or offer feedback, but I think we should do so sparingly and in a loving way. And we should do it less than we normally do. I didn't see Jesus sitting around doing that all the time. Mostly when he was critiquing religious leaders, he was defending somebody, wasn't he? Like this situation. So how do we get better at this? What are some ways, scripturally speaking, that we can get better at this? Well, it starts with a humble attitude and remembering God's grace to you. You gotta start from the point of understanding, listen, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we all need a savior. Listen, I'm a sinner and the wages of sin is death. So when you say that person better rot in hell, guess what? That's where all of us were destined to go by our actions. But the wages of sin is death, but what? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We should instead say there, but for the grace of God go I. Thankfully, God has lavished his mercy on us. We should humbly, because of his grace, his attitude towards us, be grateful to others. Ephesians 4 says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. You see, when we... When we are fast to judge others, we forget that we deserve judgment ourselves. I love when uh, uh, LG taught in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 7 uh, a while back, and he talked about taking the pole out of your eye, Jesus said, before you take the speck out of others' eye. And, and I, I, think, I think what we think is we often think, well, if I get rid of this pole, then I can start judging others. So I just got to get better myself. But the, the language there is actually present tense. Jesus is actually saying, you're always going to have that pole in your eye. So you need to stop worrying about trying to get everybody else's speck out. You need to work on yourselves. Now, there are times in Christian brotherhood where we go to one another, we, we, we see them in sin, and we try to humbly walk them back and gently walk them back. By the way, Galatians says to gently restore them. We should certainly do that, but the, we should be less focused on judging others, and we should never be condemning of others because condemnation is not our job. It's above our pay grade. And we should be discerning. There are things you have to judge, like who's going to babysit your kids and where you're going to send them to school and where you want. Those are things that it's okay to be discerning, but not, condem not condem offering condemnation and condemning towards people because we humbly remember we're flawed. flawed. James chapter 2, verse 13 says, there is no mercy for those who will not show mercy. Our attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who in humility did not consider God Equality of God, something to be great, but gave himself. The second way we can improve in this is we can think encouragement over criticism. Like we could try to focus on thinking about encouraging rather than criticizing. Scrip scripture is filled for the exhortations about encourage one another, walk with one another. Thessalonians says, uh, encourage one another. Hebrews says, spur one another on. Let's think about how we can spur one another on. And so I took this seriously a while back. And I decided that my life, I'm not perfect at this, but I want to tell you this is one area of my life that I decided I got to be better. My words carry weight, and I'm going to use them for good. And so I strive ten, with 10 different people every day to have encouraging words. Some of them are via text, occasionally via a phone call, email. Some of it's opening the door and saying nice things to someone going in and out of the store. Whatever I can do, because they get hell all week long, and I want to give them a piece of heaven. That's my goal. 
And what's amazing is sometimes I'll send that text and I have no idea. I just randomly thought of somebody and they will say, you have no idea how much that meant to me. I was going through this and I think I had no idea he was going through this, but God knew they were going through that. And he will do that constantly. You just be willing to be the pencil in his hand. Ephesians chapter four, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you do or everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear from them. Let that be our habit. Sometimes our criticism may be true, but we need to ask, is it helpful? How would it change our marriages, our relationships at school with kids and our parents and our siblings our workplaces, how would it transform our, our ball fields, our churches, our communities if we live this encourage over criticism attitude? And finally, love like Jesus. Love like Jesus. I, I don't know if you realize it or not, but our default setting is not love. Our default setting is fight or flight. Sometimes our default setting is anger. Anger is easy. Love is difficult because love is a miracle of God. How do we love? We only love because God first loved us. That's the only reason. So Paul told the Galatian church, for the whole law can be summed up with this command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out, beware of destroying one another. See, this Galatian church was fighting over what legalism was and wasn't and what should be free. And they were getting, he says, listen, just go back to the beginning. What's the greatest command? Love your neighbor as yourself. Stop fighting and devouring each other. You're destroying one another for no reason. He says, stop. And you know, elsewhere, I think it's in First Peter Peter says, love covers a multitude of sins. And that's why Corinthians describes love as patient and kind and not jealous and not proud and not keeping record of wrongs and not demanding its own way. That's love. And that kind of love drives us to a less critical spirit and more focus on compassion and forgiveness and encouragement. Because here's the truth, folks. The bottom line is criticism will not change the world, kindness will. Criticism will not change the world, kindness will. Because if you don't believe me, think about this. When the world was getting really dark, when God's one and only son, Jesus, was arrested, he was spit on, he was beaten, he was whipped, he had a thorn of crowns put in his head, and then he was hung on a cross by nails until he suffocated to death. And yet in that moment, what were some of his most profound words? As he's hanging on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He's in the most pain, most attacked, critical, abused, tortured way of his life, and he's being kind. And guess what it did? It changed the world. In fact, it changed one soldier who was there and said, surely this is the son of God. You see, kindness changes the world. Love changes the world, not criticism. And so we need to step up as a church and, and, the, and the over 2,000 people who call redemption their home need to make it their point. Over the millions of people that call themselves Christians around the world, let's make it a point to love this world, to be kind to this world, to stop tearing people down, building people up. Yes, we will speak the truth, but we'll always speak the truth with love in mind. And it's not about winning. It's about winning them to Jesus. And if we do that, our world will change, I promise you. Let's pray. God, we're so grateful for your grace and your love. It's been so good to us. You are so kind to us. Your mercies flow 
new each morning and I have no right to stand in judgment of other people when I, I just keep making the same mistakes, God, and yet you still love me. You still care for me. In fact, there's nothing I can do good to make you love me any more. There's nothing I can do bad to make you love me any less. And I know we're not you, but we do have you in us. And the more we lean into you in us, the more we can live this out. So may we do this today, Lord. We love you and we thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice and it's in his name we pray, amen. I talked a lot about the gratitude of knowing what Jesus has done for you and I think it's the best way to overcome. So for those of us who are Christians, in a moment we're gonna take communion together and it'll be reminding that his body took our sacrifice and we look and know that we're united through Christ, through his body and we take a piece of bread to remind us of that. And we take the juice and we're reminded that you know, he took our whole sin upon him. You ever feel guilty and how bad it is when you feel guilty? He had the whole world's guilt. And he did it for you and me because he loved us. God made him who had no sin to become our sin so in him we can have the righteousness of God. So two things. One is all of us who are Christians should commune with him, commune together and celebrate that. And that should make us more grateful and less critical. But then there are others of us in this room or maybe watching online that's never given your life to Christ. I want you to know he loved you so much that he gave his one and only son for you. I wouldn't give my kids for the best of you. And he gave his son for the worst of us. His grace is good. And you can come just as you are. But he won't let you leave just as you came. So maybe you need to come today as we start to sing, there'll be people up front. For all of us, you can take communion together. We can celebrate. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you need to be baptized. I don't know what your need is, but God is here today. He's promised that, and he's working in your life. Be obedient to what he calls you. Let's all be standing together whenever we're ready. Sing us out. The empty hill. The wounded heal, broken back together. Pour our bless, the weary rest. We will dance forever. Oh, blinded, blinded. 
it see chains are free but tough for now believer the outcast known the orphan home you are my redeemer behold 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 what love can do behold behold he's making all things Yes, he is. Lost, return, voiceless, heard, mourner now, rejoicing. The mountains shake, world away, creation all composing. The sad of truth, the earth renewed. The song has found its singer, the darkness light, the dead light. You are my redeemer. Behold, behold, behold what love can do. Behold, behold, he's making all things new. We We so in seeds will reap in joy. We've been struck down. We're not destroyed. We so in seeds will reap in joy. My eyes are. serve a good God as we stand together as a church and continue to sing his praises. Let's declare this together. Hatred in oceans of shame be dried up in Jesus' name. Fear filled divisions, fear filled divisions will all be erased. We claim this in Jesus' name. In all tribes and tongues, every culture and race, united in Jesus. Jesus name. So we will raise our song. Praise your mighty name. Praise your mighty name. You've won us by your blood. So hear us when we praise Jesus name. the promise. The promise upon us, one spirit filled church, together in Jesus' name. 
Jesus. In the name we're praising the one. We're praising the one who has lifted the curse. Come on. Forever in Jesus' name. So we will raise our song. Come on. We praise your mighty name. Praise your mighty name. Praise your mighty name, praise your mighty name, Lord, let your kingdom come to hear us when we pray, Jesus. Oh, Jesus' name. Together we sing. Yeah, who can stand in your way? Son of man, there is power in your name. Who can stand in your way? Son of man, there is power in your name. your kingdom come. So hear us when we pray in Jesus' name. What a good God, amen. Our church, you are on the mission field. We want to remind you that you can give to the work of what God's doing through our church. The wall boxes on the back, on our app, on our website. But we love you guys. Get out on the mission field. We'll see you next time. <laughs>